Welcome, people, to another episode of The Watchdog with me, Low Key, here on Mint Press. As you know, on a weekly basis, we are going against the grain, covering stories and covering perspectives which are regularly marginalized by the mainstream media. Because of that, we do need your support. So I would invite anybody watching us right now live on YouTube to please like, share, subscribe, comment on this video, but also support us on Patreon so we can continue doing this brilliant investigative journalism that you see from Mint Press week in, week out. Now, today we know that the whole world has its eyes on Uvalde, Texas, where we have seen 19 children and two adults killed at Rob Elementary School. When 18-year-old Salvador Ramos entered the school armed with different assault weapons and killed these children and two of their teachers. Eventually, we saw him shot and killed, but there have been serious allegations of parents present that armed police not only for over 45 minutes prevented them being able to help their children, but even there are allegations that police handcuffed, tasered and pepper sprayed parents at the scene. There are even reports that some police present entered the school to take their own children out of harm's way, but did not allow other parents to do the same. We were, of course, reeling off the back of the attack in Buffalo in, uh, on the 14th of May, which saw um, a, a, a gunman kill 10 black people inside a supermarket. Peyton Gendron was charged and is still in prison without bail. It's also just come to light that one of the six people that Penton, uh, Peyton gave some type of warning to that he would carry this out. Among those six people was a retired FBI agent. 30 minutes before the attack took place, it is believed he sent a message out to these six people that he was in communication with. Now, when talking about something like this, there are few voices that can give us as in-depth a historical context in which this is taking place can give us that perspective as Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, a historian, writer, and activist who very kindly and generously is with us now. Roxanne, thank you for joining us. How are you today? Thank you. I'm, um, I'm doing fine. I'm still, of course, mourning uh, this horrible these horrible situations, uh, ten within ten days, you know, it's um, it's it makes me angry, angry and sad at the same time. Horrific, indeed. Now, to start with, um, just to ask, you recently stated that the Democrats worship the Constitution and believe that it is a democratic document that supports a vision for a racially just society. As is known, the Monrovia program that Thomas Jefferson and others put forth following the War of Independence of the 13 colonies, Jefferson, not long after it, you know, a lot of the people in bondage had been promised uh, manumission and emancipation if they fought alongside either the British side or the side of the 13 colonies. Now, Jefferson, after it wrote that um, absorbing free people into the society would risk two things, either bloodletting or blood mixing. And these, according to Jefferson, despite the uh, well-documented relationship with Sally Hemings and the, the children that came from that, this was something that Jefferson wanted to avoid. So in tandem with the American Colonization Society, they set up uh, Monrovia in Liberia, which was the supposed returning home of people that for several generations had been in bondage of in what would become 
the United States. And you very much couch your analysis of these events, these horrific events, which, as you correctly point out, are a minority of deaths from guns that take place in the United States. But you couch them within the genocidal foundations of the United States of America. Could you just explain to us that, um, that critical um, analysis of the US Constitution and how that fits into events that we may have seen? Yes, the Constitution, you know, most, most countries, uh, not all countries have constitutions, but the ones who do, they generally um, re renew them, you know, not the method to re change the US Constitution is almost impossible. And um, they don't consider that it's sacred. Uh, I think France has had five constitutions, you know, a whole, whole new generation, a whole new nation, you know, new people. Let's change the constitution, do a new one. And the U.S. Constitution, like many things about the U.S., is unique. Uh, you know, a settler colonial state that became the most powerful military and economic state in human history. That's pretty exceptional. And um, that constitution is so um, embedded in white supremacy that it, there's no way to amend it, to change that, because it's, it's everywhere. Um, and of course, I've focused on the Second Amendment, which is one of the, you know, one of the, the Bill of Rights, individual rights that were added to the Constitution after it was um, uh, ratified. Uh, so the Bill of Rights is a is a um, private, you know, personal rights and the right to free speech, of course, is known. But the second one and the second most important to people is the Second Amendment, which does give uh, individual rights to white settlers to form well-regulated, self-regulated um, uh, militias to kill Indians and take their land. And these are later adopted as well or extended to slave patrols in the 1680s. And this is so obvious if you, if you just face what U.S. history is and not leave so much out, which U.S. historians tend to do, omission. Um, but many of them simply lie, you know, make up things, a whole different version of the United States. The Constitution is a democratic, it's for everyone. First of all, it's not democratic, even for white people in the beginning. You had to own property, and that property could be slaves, of course. And so that, you know, Andrew Jackson extended it to, um, well, basically he, he had people take more land so they could, you know, everyone could have land and property and, um, and, and be uh, citizens. But this, and of course we see it in immigration too, the uh, exclusion of people of color or horrible mistreatment. Um, the Chinese in particular, uh, Asians in general, uh, erasure, exclusion, erasure of the native people. So all of these things add up, but the Second Amendment is what is um, allows this proliferation of guns that we have. The white settler state was fully intact at, at the end of World War II. Jim Crow segregation was solid, not only in the South, but in Northern cities where uh, African-Americans had fled to slightly less um, onerous and they could have jobs, uh, but still segregated, segregated schools. Um, the Chinese were totally Asians, totally suppressed, many of them undocumented, Mexicans undocumented, Native Americans um, locked down on reservations, uh, dependent on rations after 
the Hundred Years' War to um, take the continent. And um, that was that was 1948. You know, that's that was it. And yet there were these colonial, uh, you know, national liberation movements stirring and increasing and this great fear and this competition with the Soviet Union, which was supporting national liberation movements. And of course, China, the largest population in the world, uh, had a revolution right at that time that, uh, that was um, uh, communist. And so there's, you know, a good part of the world was socialist, communist, national liberation. So the United States had to figure out, it came out of the war as the only, you know, one of the few places that absolutely had no fighting going on at all um, and came in late, you know, so that, that um, you know, it was really the Soviet Union, the Red Army that... Uh, mainly uh, ended uh, the Nazi regime. Um, so this, they started, and you, they even have open discussions in Congress about, for instance, the Genocide Convention of 1948. They didn't, they didn't ratify it. Uh, Truman signed it into law, but that's not law until the Senate uh, the Senate passes it. So it was 1988 before the Senate. Um, so they had 40 years to um, fix things in place so they couldn't be. And they openly talked about that. If we, if we ratify this, uh, that means, you know, the black people, in fact, a, a group of black people marched on uh, Washington, on Congress, with a document called We Charge Genocide. <laughs> and uh, so they, that was in 1950, I think. Uh, so it was very clear, yes, we're gonna, it's genocide. And of course, Native American um, organizations were also, you, you know, this was a document made for groups. It's the only human right, only single international law that protects minority groups, uh, groups that aren't in power. And ethnic, clear, you know, names of ethnic, uh, political um, uh, groups, and a powerful document. It's one that Native Americans depend on very strongly in their work at the United Nations. And so that fear, uh, and then you know the the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954 that desegregated public schools. This was like a shock to um, every white, especially in the South, the Southern states actually controlled, you know, really they were Democrats then, their control of Congress um, that, and, and the presidency at the time, that uh, uh, this, was, this was really a, a shock that the Supreme Court did this, and they could see the writing on the wall. If these children grow up know it, having black friends, the whole white children having black friends, they will be lost, you know, uh, to the white nationalist point of view. Even if their parents are racist, you know, everyone knows, you know, kids, kids have their own instincts, and if they're exposed to something, they're influenced by it, and kids love each other. They don't look at each other's color or anything else. Uh, they just love to play together, and so that's when you know these uh, these citizens uh, committees formed in many states to, and they linked up communism and integration together. And so a lot of the anti-communism you, you see that's, that's called anti-communism, you just lift a little, a little curtain and underneath that is actually white supremacy, what they're afraid of. They called Martin Luther King a communist, the civil rights movement filled with communists. You know, so this was um, this right wing that we see most uh, almost 
totally in power at the national level and in half the states today, that's where they had their beginning. And they have worked tirelessly to stack the Supreme Court, to make sure it's almost impossible to amend the Constitution. But, you know, international law treaties um, become a part of the Constitution once they're ratified. And so the Genocide Convention is part of the Constitution. And our lawyers, even even progressive ones, don't really use it that much because they're not trained in international law. Or if they are, it relates to other people's human rights uh, abuses, not the U.S. So that's a you know that's kind of the setting, and and they there was, nothing was ever really made of the Second Amendment because all white people were already armed and. Um, they uh, restricted guns, you know, from from slaves and then black people, too. And black people got their shotguns and all to protect themselves. But um, they um, and Native Americans weren't allowed to have guns. It was a, actually a crime to sell guns to Native Americans. And so it, the guns were in white people's hands and. They existed, there were a lot of them. There's always been this gun, gun fetish, um, the United States being such a, a violent and militaristic place and settler colonialism. So it was like, uh, like an ax. They often say that, white uh, gun nuts often say that now. Well, it's just like an ax or a hoe, or, and it is to them. Only, you know, it, it's deadly. So it wasn't until um, the mid-1970s that the National Rifle Association got taken over by a white nationalist group called the Second Amendment Foundation. A former border guard, uh, Harlan Carter, um, uh, had, he had been a member of the NRA, but he came... He formed that organization for the purpose of, uh, with others, for the purpose of taking over the NRA, which was a kind of benign hunting and fishing thing. You know, it was kind of gun fetish, but it was a fetish about hunting as a tradition, you know, and um, and it, it uh, uh, boys getting guns, you know, their BB guns and then their guns when they're 13 years old. But it was fairly benign. Um, no laws were, you know, there were no restrictions on guns until the 1930s. There were no laws either way. Guns were taken for granted. In the 1930s, when the gangs in Chicago and Baltimore and other, the, you know, the ethnic gangs, the Italian, Irish um, mafias, you know, and, uh, and team it, you know, the, the Treasury Department, which is in charge of guns, um, pushed to get uh, uh, to ban the Tommy gun, you know, the first repeating rifle. Um, and um, the NRA testified in favor of it. So it was, that's the only law that, you know, ever even existed. And, and so they start working under Harlan Carter uh, and his group. They pretty well push out the, or you know, the others become kind of benign. You know, they still do the hunting, fishing part of it. But they start building really a gun culture. And... Um, that is the beginning of what we see, you know, the proliferation of guns and, of course, the gun industry, which is one of the few manufacturing industrial corporations that didn't go offshore, you know, move offshore for, for lower wages. And it's, it's a domestic, you know, giant. Um, and you can imagine how much money they make with small arms and also export half the small arms in the world are exported by the United States. Uh, so we own, uh, in the United States, with 5% of the world's population, we own half the guns in the world. That's just stunning, you know. 
so that's that's sort of the whole you know platform which we can then you know talk about these mass shootings these just proliferation of guns this kid turned 18 years old just like the one also in buffalo i think it may have been copycat because it looked without the white nationalist stuff of the buffalo guy just oh yeah well, i'm turning 18 i can go buy guns and he i think he imitated the buffalo shooter by doing that and buying two legally in a um of course he didn't have any you know the background check he didn't exist how could he you know have the background check does nothing for someone who hasn't committed a crime <laughs> so um that's you know that uh people think well i have this right i didn't know i had and why not have it you know and then of course the kid is angry he's been bullied and uh, and at 18 years old, you know, your brain is not even completely formed, and it's certainly not emotionally. So it's, and I think even, you know, soldiers who are recruited at that age and often younger is the same thing. Um, they're very malleable and, you know, it really screws them up for life, most of them. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the platform that you need to really then, you know, within which to put these mass shootings. And one thing I'm interested in, you know, Roxanne, you point out this sort of trajectory from the first colony, Virginia, um, it being forbidden for any man to travel unless they were armed. You know, eventually it becomes sort of a, a, a legal obligation to be armed within churches, mm -hmm. to then in Massachusetts it being you know, an, an order that every single man, and by that, you know, that means white men um, having to carry weapons everywhere in public. You know, you trace that trajectory from then to now right. of this um, sort of way in which the Second Amendment is, uh, is, is viewed as sacred, but its roots within genocidal settler colonial society. But then you also make the point that you look at the example of Canada and Australia, you know, Tasmania, the entire indigenous population were completely wiped out, right. not just through diseases, but through um, hunting, being literally hunted by yeah. uh, British imperialists. You know, in Australia until 1967, right. um, legally, as far as I understand, indigenous people were defined as fauna, fauna and flora, which is plants and mm. and animals and uh, plants now what you ask and this is a question i wanted to put to you is why is it that these societies with uh, genocidal roots these settler colonial societies have not produced this same uh, situation of mass shootings repeating again and again what's the difference between the united states and these other societies yeah, it's something I see every day in the mainstream press that um, editorials, op-ed pieces, even articles that um, go over this, you know, the Australia doing away with all their guns and everyone participated after that horrible mass shooting in um, Tasmania. Um, I think over 50 people were, were killed and it was so horrifying that but they didn't have any kind of constitutional obstruction to it, you know, or a Supreme Court that said, you can't do that because the Second Amendment, you know, you had the right to bear arms and you have to take the bad with the good with the right, you know, just like free speech. You say nasty things, but but it's free speech and can't be suppressed. So that um, is true of the rest of the world. This is the only country that has such a right, a constitutional engraved right of, um, uh, and, and as you say, in the colonial period, actually having to train settlers uh, by forcing them, making it, you know, because they're always moving, uh, pushing the native people and the other thing is this, you know, the mythology about who Native people were, that they were just kind of roaming around in the jungle, you know, or in the uh, forest. 
barefoot and with their bow and arrow and um, or fighting wars with each other, you know, all the mythologies that are still pretty much there, you know, when it comes to um, um, when it comes to and, and, you know, liberal as well, this how sad it is that so many died of um, infectious diseases brought by the Europeans so that, you know, the Spanish presence for um, for a century before the Anglos came, that, you know, that, that uh, everyone had kind of died off. They were just scattered groups. That's not true. They were densely populated. They were farmers. You know, 99% of indigenous people in the Americas were farmers <laughs> before the Europeans came. Almost all the foods in the world that we eat, vegetables, um, were invented corn, potatoes, squash, invented by, um, they don't even know the origin of the corn seed. The seed has never been found. And of course, most indigenous people of the Americas, that's the most sacred uh, thing. They, they were one of the seven founding agrarian civilizations of the world by, you know, scientists. They, they, they're listed. The eastern part of North America the whole eastern part from the Mississippi, the Atlantic, Mesoamerica, and the um, Incas, the Andes, were three of the seven. So that, you know, that miss, you know, because why would you have all these laws for these people to be armed? You know, it's not like they're, they're in some place, even lions or bears. <laughs> are going to attack them uh, or you would just need maybe one gun, you know, in, in the group. But if they went out into the fields, there was this law they had to have, they had to be ready and trained in their self-organized militias to quickly be able, well, what are they afraid of? They're on stolen land, recently stolen, and on the periphery are those people who are trying to get their land back, the indigenous people. And so they, that's, you know, um, I don't know what this, this, the logic of most U.S. people, when I present this, you know, from after my book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, where I lay all this out, uh, 2014, I've spoken a lot and people, People were very sympathetic already, you know, very sympathetic to Native issues, are just stunned that they don't put these things together. You know, there, there are so many pieces left out of U.S. history that it's very hard to assemble. And also just understanding what settler colonialism is. I think, you know, it's very funny because uh, th those of us who study settler colonialism in the Anglo settler colonialism, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand. Um, we never really got any traction with it until Palestinians identified what has happened to them as settler colonialism. We look, hey, that's a, so I, I always say, well, you know, Palestine, you know, groups that I'm talking to. Well, that's what it is here. <laughs> In fact, the Israelis, the Zionists took took the model, Mahmoud Mandami has that in his book, um, neither, settler nor, um, uh, neither Settler Nor Citizen, um, that's really an important book, uh, Palestine, the United States, and South Africa, case studies of settler colonialism. So that um, that is something just very foreign to most U.S. people and Native scholars have worked very, very hard, you know, for the last 20 years or so um, of, of, you know, creating an incredible archive of, of literature, for one thing, articles and books and um, uh, essays uh, in, in poetry and in novels and in uh, history, nonfiction books. But it's such a small percentage of the output and the population is small that there have to be a lot of allies 
who understand this and all the other issues of the United States can open up people's minds once they understand settler colonialism and once they understand the theft of land for um, agribusiness, slave worked agribusiness, um, then a lot of things can start falling in place. But they, you know, that I think that erasure of Native Americans is makes it very difficult to put those things together. How and how we have this gun culture, you know, everyone being required to have guns, to form militias, to control, because there's no way the government and the army can control, you know, all these people who live in all these villages. It takes these Settlers, not all of them, when they arrive, understand that this is their fate. But they they have to, you know, if they're going to stay, it's hard to get a ride back. And, um, of course, in Australia, they they dumped uh, prisoners. I mean, sometimes people just pick pockets, you know, I mean, not, they're always portrayed as convicts. But, you know, at England, you're a convict. You're a convict if you steal a penny or a loaf of bread. You know, it doesn't take killing someone. Um, so they were forced settlers, forced settler colonial. Or, or, or even the Tolpuddle Martyrs, for example, the first trade union that formed in Britain when they yeah. were sent away for punishment to a penal colony. Yeah. It was yeah. in Australia. So I know, they have great <laughs> unions now. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that that I think is uh, essential to understanding the gun gun culture was partly, you know, the the way it is now was was partly ideologically created, um, and I think that came from the the white backlash to desegregation and the civil rights movement. Um, which made great gains. This was almost invisible in the 1960s um, that we weren't going to win. You know, I mean, I was an activist then. I was certain that we were ch changing the world, that we had this. Um, and unfortunately, too many of my, my comrades um, had this thing of, uh, you know, of, they really did, you know, that, that one of the ways it would happen is that white people would become a minority and would not have power. That's an erroneous thing because minorities have held power in human history a lot, more than not, you know, some kind of minority. And in the U.S., it's always just been the rich people. It's been the white people who have the power. And so anyone who comes in, let's say black people are hired and, you know, Native Americans or Mexicans, there's still the, the infrastructure and the whole structure, they have to fit in. They have to become white, you know, or try to become white as much as they can. So they still are not in really, a, they have to stay. I mean, some of us were rebelling against it. But the majority, you know, it's have to, I mean, you have to have a job and you have to be within that capitalist, you know, um, a capitalist country. You have to, yeah, you have to, to work uh, in order to live and you have to f just fit into what already exists. So all the Im immigrants who come, you know, are processed into, into pursuing whiteness as a, you know, to be integrated, to be an American. They call it being American, you know. But that, uh, that means, you know, I, 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 my last book was on immigration, uh, this idea of the nation of immigrants. And it was really, I intended to write it as a, as a plea to immigrants, especially immigrants of color uh, or children of immigrants of color um, to um, be aware that it is their fate unless they act and be woke that they will become Americanized and they will 
take the settler attitude and to guard against it because it's toxic. You know, it, it makes them Americans. <laughs> so that's, you know, the people of color have a very hard time with, and so there's been rebellion, you know, but it was not, it's not lack of trying to fit in because you have to survive. Your kids have to survive, you know, to keep a job. So, um, there's a lot of pressure to become an American. So, yeah, they're only, you know, the, the numbers are lower, but I think they've made exceptions for who can be white. Like the head of the Proud Boys is a, um, is a uh, African-American presenting Cuban uh, of an immigrant family. And uh, that, you know, is, but he's, He's accepted because he's he's a fascist. <laughs> so. One of the points that you make that impedes our ability to respond to these things. Now, you know, you have seen seven decades of life. You compare the 60s where you say the building of grassroots movements in comparison to what happened where sort of you replace social justice with philanthropy yeah. and in comes the sort of professionalization of activism, in comes the NGOization of these things. Could you just expand on that for us, please, when looking at across, you know, the last four to five decades, really? Yeah, it was, it was painful to watch um, or to experience having been, you know, I called myself a revolutionary, as many of us did in the, in the 60s. And we, we were everywhere, you know, at every level. Some were, you know, some were underground and, and of course, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and we had, you know, it was... We thought we had masses, and I think we weren't understanding that the masses mainly came from the anti-war movement. I mean, of course, civil rights had masses, but they're a minority group. You know, the, they're a small percentage of the population. But the masses that of all kinds of people, and of course, many, many uh, white young people, the whole SDS and... Um, other organizations are very militant, and the women's movement, the white women's movement, was very, very militant. These things were so big, but the core of it in numbers was really against the war. And when I think it was a shock to many of us, it was so one day and the next almost seemingly, you know, we went from these massive, massive protests where people get politicized in those situations. So you grow your more, you know, groups of people who are actually analyzing things. And, and if you don't have that mass movement to recruit from, it's very, very hard. So uh, it's probably impossible. So we see them going away, you know, just you look around and I, I remember um, Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda were, were still doing, you know, after 73 when the peace agreement in Paris, but the, they just took out ground troops. They didn't take out the air power. Uh, so it was really 75 when the loss, <laughs> when, you know, they, they, they were try, trying to uh, simply close it down and it was a lost war but in that time they were still among the few who were going around the country all over you know and talking and going back and forth and visiting Vietnam and they had a big effect but I remember toward the end of, you know right after the um, uh, conclusion they they wanted to continue about U.S. militarism and other places, you know, that was, was taking place. Their interventions in Africa, you know, the interventions and the killing of Lumumba and all these things. And you would see 
before you would see these masses of people because of partly the celebrity, Jane Fonda was very willing to be attract crowds. And then she very smart. I mean, her politics were excellent. And seeing just, you know, a handful of people. And I remember the American Indian movement that I got involved in. It was similar. I mean, it was a big thing, wounded knee, uh, really also brought in new people and new people who knew nothing about, you know, native people. And it was it lasted long enough, almost two months, to really gain attention and huge support. And then by the next year, they're killing and arresting AIM people, and there's just this floating away, you know, of all these support groups. I mean, they still existed, but the numbers. So that's when I think the philanthropists moved in. And the philanthropists had, were very important to these movements, but it was without any kind of strings. You, you have nothing to say to us. They beg to give people money. You know, I know. I, 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 got, I said, I don't trust, you know, taking money from people. I come from a very poor background. And that, to me, is dangerous, you know, taking money from, what do I know? What are they going to, you know, do? And I was very suspicious, but um, on the take some, you know, it's just cautious, but most people, middle-class people, you know, it just, um, and the, and these philanthropists were mostly activists themselves. And then when there was little activity in the 1980s, I don't think they had evil intentions necessarily, but suddenly they were in charge and calling the shots, you know, helping form groups. And you can't do that top down, you know, the, it really is astroturf, which they always say about the right wing. The right wing has a big mass base, actually. NRA has chapters in every county in the United States, and they're all grassroots. They don't take orders from headquarters, are not funded. They're voluntary groups, grassroots groups. And we have nothing like that now. And, and then people started working, you know, and then a new generation just thought, you know, that's a, one career opportunity to be paid to organize. That was a foreign idea to us from the 60s. None of us were paid to do anything. You know, we lived on peanut butter <laughs> sandwiches. Um, there, was, there was just, you know, that all just evaporated. And the Reagan era, of course, was very oppressive. And um, it was, uh, it, it was de we were defeated, you know, the, and there was that people wouldn't really admit it, a lot won't admit it now, or well, there's this and that, we were defeated. We didn't win that war. <laughs> and, uh, but there was that you know, uh, people who stayed engaged, working, never quit, you know, they're organizing, ask for money for it. There was still this lack of energy, lack of enough people and not being able to. But the United States is, you know, very experienced in uh, buying people off and offering other things, you know, like college scholarships, affirmative action. Now we've gotten to the point where a lot of really good people have come out of, you know, the Ivy Leagues and Stanford and these places, people of color, who are very are activists. But I would say there are f few, you know, but most go into corporate, corporate law or politics or business or whatever um, to make money. You know, to to because uh, they have those opportunities. They don't have to fight for them. You know, they get recruited while they're there. So the kind of people who in the '60s would have maybe they would have continued their education, but their hearts were in in the movement. And another thing I'm quite interested in 
is Yashia Levine, Yashia Levine in his book Surveillance Valley, his assertion is that post the Vietnam defeat, the US military set about designing the ARPANET, which was the basic system of what would then become the World Wide Web, the internet, and that there was some belief within the US military that a system like this would be very useful for the prediction of unrest and for counter insurgency, insurgency purposes. Yeah. Now, you've also got a great book um, by Stephen Carr, if I remember correctly, his first name, The Shallows, which looks at the long-term effect on cognitive development um, in the use of the internet on a daily basis. Now, you, of course, many of the people watching this, the way that they have sort of participated politically in the world has been in this sort of high-tech goldfish bowl yeah. whereby everything about what we do is being used to create character points which are on one hand used to advertise to us more effectively but on the other hand no doubt used for surveillance purposes how did political involvement change from the time of the internet to before the internet existed what would you say is a, is a major difference for you that you may have observe well you know of course uh, um when the internet came in i was older and you know formed so i've i've never uh i i i've always treated it with suspicion uh in terms of of a kind of addiction because there is that that you know feeling that especially after um social media, you know, the, the Facebook and the, they proliferate Twitter and then TikTok and all of them. You can go down this rabbit hole, you know, you, you, you start looking and then you go here and then you go there and you look up and like six hours have passed. And only because you maybe have hunger pains. Well, oh, oh my God, oh, I missed this appointment or something. And when that happened to me a couple of times, I, the first time it happened to me was 2008, when um, uh, it was 2009, but I had, uh, I my brother was dying of cancer in Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma. At, and I went to be with him, you know, in, in his last days, and he mostly was sleeping. And I... Um, I had he had, uh, I didn't have a laptop at the time, but he had a computer, and I just I uh, signed up for Facebook, and I got really really deeply involved. And it was pretty um, primitive at first, you know. I mean, it was not as many people or anything. I get in these huge arguments, you know, and there were it, it would just go on and on and on and on and. It, would, it kept me from being very depressed and sad. You know, it kept me, uh, I think it was, it was okay, but then it also scared me. You know, I said, this is, this is something I have to be careful with. So I always have. I, I very purposely don't, uh, I, I do have Facebook and Twitter. It's good, it, you know, uh, people I have that we, our books that we publish and discuss. If you, if you can be disciplined, but mostly really young people who come to it want to socialize on it. You know, it's a social, and the, I, I don't so. I mean, most people my age don't socialize on, or maybe they, you know, have a group of some kind that they, a book reading group or something, and it's kind of social, but it's not, you know, um, obsessively and how you look and how you talk and how many likes you get and everything and suicide happening with young people that um, feel, you know, they're not making it. It's, it's just ramps up a whole lot of social problems. Um, maybe to a degree that is, I'm not sure if the, um, uh, I actually met some of the people at uh, uh, Los Alamos who had been involved in the military uh, invention of the internet. And, um, 
I never got the idea from them. Of course, they may were probably given orders that there was any plan as such. So I'm not sure we can see that. They may at, at now, you know, later seeing, wow, this is this is something we can really use. And of course they, they do. And with that post 9-11 war on terror, they their surveillance mechanism uh, ramped up like I don't think any of us even understand that everything is known about us now. <laughs> everything. I, I forget I've forgotten about um, privacy, you know, forget it. You drive yourself crazy. There's no such thing unless you close the door and never um, do anything. <laughs> so that's, and, and I'm sure that's spread around the world, but I think it's most powerful here. I can't imagine that any other country has that kind of surveillance technology that the U.S. had already, you know, had the grounds for, but just had no congressional interference, no oversight, just go for it. And uh, that was, of course, revealed by the young man, what's his name, who's now in exile in, in Moscow. Um, Edward Snowden. Uh, Edward Snowden. That's what he revealed to us. And that was a long time. I mean, that is quite a while ago. It must be much, much worse now. Hmm. And, and of course, WikiLeaks has, you know, and they've both been criminalized. So not many other people are doing these things, you know, uh, yep. get it, revealing what, what's happening. So, Roxanne, in your experience and your life of writing, of activism, of struggling, of fighting back, of pushing forward, what would you say? is the greatest and most enduring lesson from the human experience that you have drawn? Uh, it's, uh, you know, I have always been, use that Gramscian phase of uh, uh, optimism of the spirit and, you know, pessimism of the mind. Um, but, and then I, I remember the, the Cubans had a saying that uh, a communista tiene que ser optimista. To be a communist, you have to be an optimist. I think Che, that was something Che said. So that was very, you know, um, it was kind of a decision. You have to be an optimist because otherwise you, you're you useless. You know, you have to, when I see a pregnant woman or a, um, a baby or a child, I think these are optimistic people. They think there's a future. It actually makes me feel better these days. You know, I mean, that's getting to the basics of uh, kind of maintaining optimism about humanity. I feel so grateful that I have, you know, uh, uh, historical materialism, uh, dialectical materialism, Marxian um, thought and structure that uh, make me able to understand what's going on. But I think most people don't have that kind of possibility. I mean, just to know it is at least to give you some sense of, to be realistic what's going on, you know, and not hide it from yourself, not to be Pollyannish. Oh, everything's going to be okay because there's such good people in the world. We'll get we'll get gun control because seventy percent of the people want gun control. No, it's not how it works, you know. But you you don't then just get depressed. You say, well, this is how we have to strategize and all, you know, to make a difference. But it's pretty overwhelming, I think, um, in the last ten years not just since Trump, but in the last 10 years, the, you know, well, it came with Obama, you know, that, that white nationalist backlash of um, the Tea Party people. And the, I come from rural Oklahoma, so I'm very familiar with um, uh, the people, you know, that, that formed the Tea Party and white nationalists, I, some of my relatives, actually. And I... The, 
they've been, you know, they've been suppressed by the power of, of civil rights and human rights and women's rights. And they, when they saw, a, you know, a black president, this was too much, I think. And all of those strings, you know, of course there were people doing it and people funding it, the Koch brothers, you, you know, really got involved in funding the Tea Party and then, you know, the white nationalists and, and January 6th and where they really, really revealed themselves. You know, I think that's the main thing to come out of that. It's not oh, insurrection, but there was performance, you know, a warning. It, it wasn't an insurrection as such. But that, you know, I think me and, you know, my comrades I'm closest to, um, it's very hard to see a future, you know, especially with climate catastrophe. And I, I think we have to, we, we have to do something, you know, we can't just sit, sit aside. So I, I just think the only thing in history that has ever made changes is mass, mass, masses of people in the street and not expecting to get publicity for it. Probably no one knows that this March for, your, uh, for Our Lives, these students, survivors at uh, Parkland, organized in the last two days of organized demonstrations in high schools, walkouts all over this country. I haven't seen a single thing in the press about that, not even the left press, the nation or anything, because that's not, they, they don't care about that. They care about changing people, you know, but we need to know about it that's going on and we need to do that, all of us, in any way we can. I mean, the interesting crossover there that you mentioned with the Koch brothers funding particular right-wing movements is here in the UK, um, money was put into um, a right-wing Islamophobe, sort of cre Islamophobe, creature of the war on terror, Tommy Robinson, through the Donors Capital Fund, which was a funnel for the Koch brothers. But then what you also saw in, in, in addition to one of the points you just made is when students here took part in a massive walkout um, on the issue of climate change, you saw the Extinction Rebellion um, emblem included on an intelligence document Within schools, you have something called prevent, which is basically quite a totalitarian thought police way in this country yeah. in which children as young as three can be questioned by counter-terror police without the knowledge of their parents or even their parents being informed. That's, that's a statutory duty in all public sector institutions in this country. So the emblem of Extinction Rebellion at the same time that walkout took place was included on one of these documents to say that if children are seen in schools to identify with Extinction Rebellion or these ideas, then uh, they should be um, subject to this kind of surveillance. Roxanne, it's been so, so amazing to talk to you. I really have appreciated your insight and wisdom, and I hope that long may we benefit from your perspectives and from your the depth of your historical knowledge. I think it's also important for us to remember that just yesterday, uh, this horrifying footage came out um, from uh, Brazil where we saw two police officers take a man into a car and sort of create this improvised gas chamber in which he was killed. Um, the, the footage is all over the internet. It's well known what kind of um, violence the Brazilian police in a really aimed way against, um, you know, class violence takes place on a daily basis yeah. in Brazil. It's really much, uh, very much a sort of feature of the Brazilian state. As you can see, Manar is showing that horrific footage there. Right. Um, 
so yeah, thank you very much to everyone for joining us for this episode of the Watchdog. I would encourage everybody to purchase and read and appreciate Roxanne Dunbar Ortez um, uh, books, and it will be great to have you on again at some yes. point on the Watchdog. Let's do thank it again. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank everyone who's with us. Thank you very much. Yeah,